Awesome. Everyone, thank you so much for joining uh, TAM Lab 87 today. So my name is Bill. I'll be uh, presenting this. Uh, this is uh, setting up and using vSAN file services. There we go. Um, so quick reminder, uh, our customers can actually submit session ideas as well. So uh, if you're a customer checking this out online, um, go ahead and reach out to your TAM with uh, you know, your name, your, your title, uh, or the title of the session and then the description, uh, and then work with your TAM to, to you know, get it produced and, and uh, ready for uh, everybody to view online. So this is me. Uh, I'm a, a TAM, a team lead uh, here at VMware. I've been here about four years. I've worked in IT. Uh, I've covered a ton of different customers in different uh, in different markets. Um, I'm a team lead on the leadership team here, a V expert and VMUG speaker, and then I got some certs. So, okay, what are we trying to accomplish today, right, with this uh, lab on vSAN file services? So, um, quick touch on the overall architecture, right, and then understand some of the limitations about using the solution um, and some of the prereqs, and then we're actually going to get into the lab. Um, and actually configure it and show how we can use it and then clean up. So uh, if you haven't seen this yet, this is what the solution looks like. I totally stole this from our, uh, our documentation. I didn't create it. Um, file to. services is made of a couple layers here, right? So when you enable it, um, it creates this vSAN distributed file system on top of vSAN. And so um, this VDFS file system is an aggregate of vSAN objects. So it creates some vSAN objects and then works on top of those. Uh, it creates a, a handful of um, VMs, these appliance VMs or uh, file service VMs, excuse me, FSVMs. Each one of those interacts with that VDFS and um, presents uh, NFS and SMB. Uh, you'll find that there'll be one VM uh, deployed per host up to 32. Um, and then at the bottom here, you have the file services control path and monitoring, right? So that lives at vCenter. It handles like the deployment of the VMs and the service, um, you know, management, making sure that um, when a host goes in maintenance mode, that that VM is, uh, is destroyed and things like that. Um, and also monitoring, and we'll touch on monitoring here in a little bit. And so effectively across your vSAN uh, cluster, you have a single uh, VDFS, uh, and it's served by those VMs, right? And those provide your NFS. So uh, it's a very logical, you know, build on top of what vSAN has already. Uh, and so from a limitations, again, totally stole this from our documentation, um, two host clusters and stretch clusters are not supported. If you have vSAN 7, you can uh, support up to 32 file shares and uh, eight file servers. But if you go up update one, then you get 32 file shares and then your 32 file servers, one per host. Um, you also are, it's not supported to mount the NFS share from an ESXi host and run VMs. Uh, there's other ways to accomplish sharing vSAN um, outside of uh, a vSAN cluster. This is not the way to do it. Now from a prereq perspective, right? We got a, a little list here, so we'll run through it. Um, if you're gonna use SMB or NFS 4.1 uh, to leverage some Kerberos, you need Active Directory. You need a bunch of static IP addresses for the, the service in the FS, uh, FSVM node. So those virtual machines, each one needs uh, a static IP and DNS entries. Uh, all of your IP should be in the same subnet. We don't want the, the traffic being routed. Um, and then you also need a distributed switch uh, version 6.6.0 or higher. Uh, and then you need, even though the VMs can run on, you know, some of the same management subnets or whatever you want, um, having a dedicated port group for, for, um, for these file services is important because it does enable Mac learning and forge transmits. If you don't already have those set up, there could be implications on an existing port group, right? So having a new port group for that helps isolate that change, but still give it the functions it needs. And then if you're using NSX, uh, you need to manually ensure that those are gonna be set up uh, on the NSX side. And then the last thing here is uh, if, you, uh, if you're gonna enable this, right? You're, uh, let's see here, with no NSXT in your environment, you need four cores and 16 gigs of RAM. And if you have NSXT, you need some more RAM. 
So just keep that in mind as you're considering like, how would I place this stuff in my environment? Um, and so, with, yeah. All right. Oh, okay. We'll move on. Oh, we have a question here in the chat real quick. Can you commingle native vSAN and vSAN file services in the same cluster? Yeah, so you can, in fact, that's how my lab uh, exists. So I do have vSAN and vSAN file services in my cluster and uh, I leverage both at the same time. Uh, we also have a question here. Why does it need to double the, the, the memory for NSXT? That is a really good question. I don't have an answer, sad to say. Um, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. I, I guess I could speculate. Um, does the function need a special license? You know, that's a really good question. And again, I apologize. I don't know what license version um, we would need. If somebody uh, on chat wants to check. It doesn't need a license. It just, it's on enterprise. Oh, is it on enterprise? Yeah. Hey, there we go. Thank you. Enterprise or enterprise plus, uh, no license required. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Okay. Perfect. All right, so let's head over to the lab um, because PowerPoint is boring. So um, let me do this. And I know it's not the most exciting way to start the lab. Um, I recorded the setup of this because it does take a, a little bit of time and for a lab to sit here and watch something uh, go through, you know, all of its paces just takes a little while. Um, so let me go ahead and start this. We'll walk through it and then I'll kill the video and we'll go hop into the lab. So I did this last night. Um, and so you can see here that we're going to go create a new port group. Uh, I am on uh, version seven, so that's above the 6.6.0 requirement for uh, the, the distributed switch. So we're going to go ahead and create it, just, you know, my own naming convention here. Um, it's a pretty straightforward uh, port group setup uh, because it does most of the configuration itself. So you just need to kind of create it. Um, and here, you know, you can see I'm specifying my uh, my VLAN. Uh, since I only have, you know, a small home lab, keeping it at the default was exactly what I needed. And now you can see there's, hey, there's port group, um, and the policies you can see here that they're sitting at um, reject for for all of those, and, and we'll see that two of those change. And then going back to the cluster, uh, that's my vSAN cluster, right? So we're going to head down to vSAN services. Um, and then you'll find a file service there and it's sitting at, at disabled with like no information. So here you go, hit enable. Um, and I'm gonna pause this here real quick. Give me one second. So uh, if we're to go back and play just a little bit. There we go. Um, so again, keeping in mind, you know, at this point to get to where you need to be, right? You need to make sure that you, um, that you have all of your IP addresses and DNS set up, right? It's going to be really important going forward to have that uh, as their prereqs. So make sure you have that set up ahead of time. You understand how many nodes you're going to have um, and that DNS is, you know, created and propagated. Um, similarly, if you're going to use Active Directory, right, make sure you know, um, you know, you, the credentials that you're going to bind with, if there's going to be any kind of OU uh, that you're going to, uh, to, to, you know, deposit these servers into as well. So now we're just starting to fill out uh, fill out this information, you know, that's relevant for setting up, right? Like DNS, uh, file services domain. Um, I tend to use vb.info for everything. Uh, my domain is vb.info. Um, from an OU perspective, I'm just going to have it dump them into computers. Uh, my AD is pretty pretty weak. Bill, we have a, a question in the chat: Is uh, IPv6 or only IPv4? Uh, IPv6, as I understand it, works for the file, the primary file service, but everything else needs IPv4. Thanks. Yep. All right, so there, we picked our, our uh, vSAN file services uh, port group, right, that we just created. And it's gonna go monkey with that here in a minute. Um, now, what I like about this is it's, let's take a quick second here. It's assuming when we put in these IP addresses that we've picked some serial IP addresses, right? So, you know, in this instance, it's like 175 and then 176, 177. So you can have it do all of the work. And if you have 30 nodes, letting it do all of the work and filling out those fields is gonna be really a good use of your time. Um, so here, we'll put that in, hit autofill. Awesome, and then DNS. Now in my environment, um, for some reason, this vCN file services too is still being cached or something. So I had to just manually go edit that. It's still a legit valid um, 
that DNS entry. Now, one other thing I want to call out here at the top, <clears throat> there's a file service agent that needs to either be downloaded and the process will do that. Um, sad to say I've already done it. So it didn't capture that part of the process. You can either let it do it on its own or you can go manually download the bits. Documentation explains you know, how to get those bits and then how to provide it here. So if you have a, a server that doesn't have internet access to go download it, you can go do it manually. Um, so let me go ahead and continue on then. So you know, reviewing, I put some data in here, right? And then uh, let's kick it off. So you know, it hasn't been asking for a whole lot, right? Like this isn't um, overly complicated to provide the information it needs. Uh, you can see here on the left, <clears throat> we have a resource pool here now called ESX Agents. And we're gonna start seeing three vSAN file service nodes in here. <clears throat> so let's let that go, right? You can also see down here, looking at progress, um, we're installing the agent itself now, uh, well, the process is on each of these hosts. And the same process for de uh, deploying the OVF template will happen a couple more times. So let me go ahead and click through. Um, so just you know, 30 seconds later, we can see that we have all of these nodes here. Um, you can see they're being cloned, which is kind of a nice way to do it. Enabling the service on the ESX host. This is what seems to be taking the most time in the process. And DRS is kicking in and moving some stuff around because I just started up a whole bunch of new VMs. Um, in here, looking at the file service domain being created. And there we go. Oh, let me go back. Okay. <clears throat> So this is where we get off the video boat here. Um, but let's take a quick look um, at what we've seen. So, you know, before this was all empty, right? Just a bunch of dashes and nothing. Now we actually have the information we put in so we can understand what the configuration is of, of the environment. So I appreciate you uh, hanging out while we run through that video. Um, let's head over to the actual lab. And this is pretty much where we left off, right? So. Again, you can see the same information on my cluster. Um, let's take a quick look here at the vSAN, the, the, the node, right? So it did allocate uh, eight gig VMs and four vCPUs with quite a bit of storage, though it's thin because it's on vSAN. And if we go look at the, um, uh, at the uh, port group, we can see now that change, right? So now it, it changed forge transmits to accept and Mac address changes to accept as well. Recall when we set it up, it was set as reject. So it did that, it knew what it needed to do, which is, which is pretty sweet. Okay, so let's go back to the cluster because that's where we live uh, with vSAN. And so now that this is enabled, there's this uh, file shares um, option that is opened up at the bottom. So if I go ahead and open that up. Now, um, normally this would be blank. Um, I wanted to let, I wanted to test this um, and leave some data in there um, overnight. But, you know, again, you can, you can imagine that there's nothing in this field, you know, when you first start it up. Um, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna create a new file share. Pretty straightforward process. Um, you know, let's call this one TAM Lab uh, NFS. And you can see our options here are, are SMB and NFS. Um, and we have the option of specifying um, a different protocol. So in this instance, I'm just gonna specify three uh, because why not? We also have um, different warnings, whoops, uh, and quotas that we can, we can configure. So in this environment, for some reason, I wanted to have a, a warning at five uh, gigs and a hard quota at 10. Um, and then, What's really nice about this is uh, all of the content that goes into this file service, right? This uh, this NFS service here or share is going to have this tag associated with, or this label, I should say. Um, and so you can help organize, understand how that data is, uh, you know, being used and accessed. Um, and if you're used to NFS, you've probably seen something like this before, where you know you come up with uh, who can access your service. Um, if you do based on IP and sub, you know, IP subnet here, you can actually add a bunch if you want. Um, you can change the permissions based on a subnet and also do root squash if that's a use case for you. 
for the lab, don't really care. I'm just going to do any IP and I'm going to move on and then finish. All Bill, right. We have a question in the, in the QA. Why does it need to change the port group settings? Oh, um, as I understand it, part of it is um, for replication. And also if, um, if there's a host crash, moving the, um, moving the VIP around uh, the, the service IP address as well. There's probably other reasons that I'm not aware of, but that's what, you know, at least a couple of the reasons that I know of. Okay, so we create an NFS. Let's, for fun, create, uh, that was a version three. I'm gonna do a version four real quick. It's just subtly different. Um, Tam lab, that's a four one. NFS, and this time I'm, I'm gonna pick four one. Now you can see it changed a little bit, um, where if we were here with Kerberos, then we can actually change, um, you know, some of the authentic authentication options and things like that. Um, I'm just gonna keep it default here. And let's do something very similar. File server, uh, NFS 4.1. Now, one of the advantages to NFS 4.1 is like PNFS. So rather than um, having uh, a single stream like with NFS 3, uh, NFS 4.1 um, can enable you to use multiple streams to multiple uh, of these file servers in there. So in theory, assuming you're not in my lab that's kind of storage performance constrained, uh, you could potentially see better performance using uh, NFS 4.1 versus 3. Okay, so we're, we're cruising. Let's go ahead and hop over to, um, to a Linux host that I have set up. And I want to, um, let's do this. There we go. Let's actually show connecting and, uh, and, and checking this out. So, oh, excuse me. The first thing I want to do, I need to copy a couple commands over um, to, to prep the environment. So let me get that over here. So we're going to create a couple mount points um, on this machine. Uh, nope, that's not it. That's not it. That is not it. Oh, this is going to be fun if, let's see here. Okay, and we're gonna do four one as well. So now we have these mount points that we're gonna go ahead and mount um, these NFS shares to. So it's kind of it's kind of cool. Uh, some of the options, well, some of the ways we try and make this easier. Um, so I'm gonna say type is NFS. I'm gonna make it a little verbose, and I'll show you why. Um, we come back over here, back to the uh, the web client or the vSphere client, and we select one of these file shares. You can see this new option pops up, copy path. And if we open that up, it shows you actually this is the path to that um, to that share. And you can notice here it picked one of the other hosts, right? We have three three nodes. Sorry, yeah, picked one of the other nodes. We have three nodes. Uh, it picked vSAN file two as the appropriate one for this. So I'm gonna go ahead and paste that in here. And then I'm gonna tell it where to mount. Uh, okay, now the reason I wanted to show, have this V in here was to show that um, NFS clients, like on, on the Linux side, typically roll through versions trying to match the protocol version to the services being provided. So you can see here that this mount NFS, mount of type NFS tried version 4.2, 4.1, right? Version three, and then it got to version three protocol 17 and then it, and then it worked. I'm gonna do the same thing here now with this um, NFS 4.1. So again, copy path. The path is slightly different, but that's fine. Um, I don't need the, the verbose here. Um, doesn't get as much this go around. Mount. Four, one. 
Okay. Now you notice the, the, the path changed a little bit. So if we're looking up here for the NFS3, it's the file server, in this instance, VCN file two, and then a path to the folder. With NFS4, it's slightly different where you can see it's the file server, but then this time it's VCNFS TAMLAB. So um, it handles the pathing and the organization of that slightly different. But from the server's perspective, if we look, you can see there's, um, there's the two mount points here. So next thing I want to do is just, I mean, we, we mounted it. Why don't we put a little data over there? So in my home directory, I just have a, a one gig, like a large file. And then I also have the, uh, the, the Linux kernel source. Um, so let's just copy it over real quick. Sure, that should work. So, you know, having my, my uh, vSAN environment, having like a cache drive and like one capacity drive, um, that lines up with, <laughs> with what I've seen from performance. So I was pretty happy to see that, that it wasn't a, a big drop. Um, and I wasn't expecting a major, a major gain um, as part of it. So, you know, pushing those files to the uh, NFS3 uh, file share works. And then let's see here. Do the same thing to go into the 4.1. Slightly, uh, slightly higher speeds. Um, there we go. Took a little longer on the um, on the smaller the, the Linux source, but that's fine. You know, we're talking four and six seconds versus ten and one for the previous. So I don't know. I'd call it kind of a wash a little bit for my environment, but um, that's that. Now, one of the ways this can be really useful for our customers um, or even our home labs um, is persistent storage for containers. Trying to figure out, you know, we know that's one of the challenges that um, that a container, any kind of container initiative has is, you know, what do you do with that, that persistent storage? So, um, you know, with vSAN's ability to now present NFS um, as, as these, you know, the file share, it could end up being a really cool tool um, for, for container um, initiatives. All right, so we got NFS down. Let's uh, let's go ahead and get rid of this and we'll make this big again. And let's create one for Windows. Actually, real quick, let's refresh here uh, because we did put some data in there. And so now you can see here that we have, um, in both instances, it's the same files. They were correctly reporting 1.11 gigs. Um, so we can even just see that here. I'm gonna add a new one, SMB. So again, change the protocol to SMB. Um, if we want to do encryption because of reasons, then you could totally just, you know, flip the switch. Um, you know, I called this out, or I didn't call this out earlier, but it was uh, available for NFS. You do have access to your different vSAN storage policies. So based on the policies you have defined or you want to define, you can also use that to help protect this data maybe differently than you would other kinds of workloads. Um, and there is also a new policy that's created here. It's the FSVM profile, do not modify. That's created and applied to these um, ESX agents, right? That provide the file services. So uh, don't modify it. Anyway, so let's go over here. Bill, let's... before before we go on too far, we've got a, qu a couple of questions in the Q&A. Uh, oh, great. Um, wanted to see if you could address some of those. Let's do it. Okay. Uh, how are the files on this NSF service protected, replicated? Assuming this is more black box than the way VM files are protected by vSAN. Mm. That's a big topic. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a big one. Um, you know, it's going to leverage partially the configuration of vSAN, right? That, you know, we know it doesn't support stretch clusters, for example. So, um, you know, relying on, on kind of that... Um, well, I guess that geo, potentially geo different, right? Like if you have a different cluster in a different data center across town or whatever else, as long as it's within latency, um, that that won't apply here. Um, I'm not sure how like uh, SRM, for example, would handle that. Um, 
so that's a really, really good question. That might be a, an interesting session for, you know, a follow-up, honestly. Um, and then Stephen Ling has a, can NSF client RPC the tag if yes, how to do that? I don't know if they can, I'll be honest. Yeah. Then what is the purpose for the tag? Just only for the uh, recenter to maintenance and management those files stored inside of the NFS? Yeah, so the tags you can actually use because you can add whatever labels you want in here. So it's up, it's up to you to define what those labels mean for your organization. It could be uh, maybe it's project code or application or owner or whatever else. But, but the NFS client is not able to access that tag, right? For example, if I would like to something like a, a LS or search some file and then I would like to use the tag, does it work? Mm. Yes, know. as I understand, it does not know about the tag. It only knows about the data within. Okay, I got it. And then the follow, oh, another question from, from Steven is, if the vSAN file to ESXi host were put into maintain, will the NS NFS service be able to migrate to another host automatically? Yeah, can. so uh, yes, it will. So if a host is put in a maintenance mode, um, part of the activities is shifting that, um, that workload um, and moving that IP. Um, and How about the access point? Yep, the, exactly. The, the, okay. Yep, and then the VM that the 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 node itself is actually deleted. So as you go into maintenance mode, that that VM gets deleted. When it comes out of maintenance mode, part of the activities of restoring vSAN functionality um, on a cluster with file share enabled, um, it'll go ahead and redeploy that service node and then pick up where you know it left off. I think okay. I think that that answers the, the the next question was kind of in the, in the same vein of uh, yes, down one. yeah yep and you know for the for the 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 instances where like PNFS for example um, you know can use multiple um, multiple servers and that's something that uh, SMB four one can present um, you know you'll be down a path if you will right like a performance path you'll still have access to the data but now it's two nodes in my lab environment it'd be two nodes that could serve you instead of three until it comes back but service will still be there okay okay so, thank you yeah no, thank you i appreciate it um so i'm gonna go ahead and finish this real quick um you notice that setting up smb didn't have that network um you know the question about you know who can access it because you know, that's something that NFS protocol does, whereas SMB doesn't, it's handled other ways. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and create the share real quick and let's let that finish. And there we go. So now you can see it's here in the list. It wasn't that hard, right? We specified some Active Directory credentials early on that, um, you know, help join it to the domain. And then now we're kind of living under domain, um, domain policy, if you will, for, uh, for how we, you know, kind of manage these things. So, you know, as before, when we had, you know, we selected an NFS share and we see this copy path. Well, now if we do the same thing for SMB, it's slightly different. We have a copy MMC command and then also copy path. So uh, let me uh, grab this copy MMC command, right? So it's copied and you can see here it's calling, uh, you know, FS management on MSC and it's passing a computer to it. So let's go ahead and hop over to, um, so this is a server 2012 R2 machine on my domain. Um, I'm logged in as administrator uh, to the domain and I have a command prompt running as administrator. So if I were to go ahead and paste this command in here, this is very similar to how you'd be handling other file servers um, in your environment, right? So it, it, it popped right up, which is great. Um, so we're seeing that authentication happen um, through Active Directory. Uh, you can see we have some shares here, like this is, you know, this is the primary one. We can set some share permissions. Um, you know, if we, yeah, there we go. If we wanted to, we could do, you know, file server one.db.info, file server, excuse me, dot db.info. Spell it wrong, file server. File server, uh, let's try it again. We'll do it this way. There we go. So VCNFS, here's my TAMLAB SMB, right? Similar to how we saw with, um, with NFS 401, we also saw 
you know, VCN FS show up in the path. Um, but you know, now we have, uh, we have nothing in here. And if I look at open files, let's refresh this, you know, there's not really much going on. I can go ahead and create a new thing in here. Uh, Pam lab. All right, so we can create files and I still have the same over here on the far left. I know the icons are a little small, but you know, large file and then the Linux kernel, uh, same ones from that, uh, from that host or the Linux host. So I'll go ahead and just copy them in here. And we're seeing, you know, similar ish performance. Um, whoops. So let's let that finish up. There we go. So we moved our, uh, you know, 112 gig or meg file and a gig file over. Um, so that's that's pretty sweet, right? So with the right permissions in your Active Directory domain, now you're able to give um, give users and services access to another uh, SMB share in your environment. So that is that's that with um, with creating the shares. I want to walk through just a couple more things uh, here, real quick. Oh, let's see here. Um, we have a question in the Q and A. Is vSAN applying dedupe and compression to files on these shares? It depends on what your um, what your vSAN policies are. So, if you need it to, it can. Um, so, we're back here at configure, um, looking at the file shares. I'm going to go ahead and switch over to um, to monitor. And actually, before I do that. Um, if we look at this file share health and recall that we set up um, a policy that says if you're over five gigs, that's a warning, right? And so that's what we have triggered here, right? This test environment where I, uh, the share where I put a whole bunch more data in there, right? We're over the five gigs um, is throwing that warning and we're seeing that here at the cluster level. Hey, you got some file share health issues. If we go over to monitor, we can look at you know cluster level um, you know things that are going on. I'm going to scroll down to vSAN, and first thing I want to do is look at virtual objects. And we now we have this vSAN file shares objects. And so you know whereas you know we we traditionally see virtual machines and their their hard drives and you know where does that data live and, and whatever else. Now we can actually see file shares and whether or not there's issues with the objects supporting those. So that's kind of nice, you know if. Uh, if you have a VCN crash or uh, an issue going on, and you know sometimes we see um, objects that are uh, kind of confused on where they should live or if they're in uh, any kind of error state, we see that here for the file shares, which I was pretty pretty happy to see. We can look at capacity. So again, we you know if, if we if we look back at configure, it's like all right, we get a sense of what's going on, but in the overall relationship of my vSAN environment, how does this storage um, you know, play into it? And so these files are stored, they're considered user objects, just like my ISOs, for example. Uh, so you know, we can look here, we can click on the donut and we can see here that, okay, well, of the 144.55 gigs of user objects, um, we're using about 20 gigs of files. And then last performance here. Um, so now that we have that enabled, we have file share as an option. So I can hop up here to file share, um, and it, you know, it defaults to defaulted to this NFS one, but we can certainly select a different one, like maybe SMB. Oh, let's do four one then. There we go. Um, and so now we can actually see, you know, how things are going. Um, you know, latency for my lab environment is not amazing. Uh, so I'm not shocked to see it that high. Hopefully, you know, an enterprise or a more mature lab would have a better performance there. Um, but yeah, we can see, you know, what's going on with IOPS latency and throughput for our shares over a period of time. So if there's any questions about that container workload, um, you know, we do have some, uh, some visibility there. All right. Any, uh, any questions, comments, thoughts about what we've seen so far? My last step here is to show you how to disable and clean everything up. So I, I don't want to wreck the environment quite yet if there's any any questions or anything you want me to click on. Is there a Tanzu version of this or um, a Tanzu plug to see what it looks like to leverage file services? 
Um, I'm not aware of, of no, maybe there's other people on the line, <laughs> Mr. Tilkins, um, that might have a, a better answer. I don't know of a specific plug in uh, versus, you know, just presenting NFS. Um, you know, if you enable vSphere with Kubernetes or vSphere, excuse me, vSphere with Tanzu, um, that may enable some features. I'm just not sure what those are. Yeah, my, my question would be things like, what is the, what do the tagging look like on the shares when um, a Kubernetes cluster is spun up, for example? Because um, I, I guess when we present it to customers, uh, it is all done on the developer side pretty much. So I would like to see what it looks like on the operator side, on our side, just, just a curious thing. Mm, yeah, well, I'll make note of that because that could be a good follow-up as well. Um, so, you know, how do we, how do we build on top of um, VCN file services? Cause it's not just, it's not just here's a file server, but let's, you know, let's actually talk about what we can do with it. So I appreciate that. I'm just gonna make a note. Well, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Tonzo, okay, great. What's the behavior uh, of losing a node? Well, you know, that's, that's interesting um, if you lose a node because, you know, you can already envision that you're going to see a delay in, um, in some traffic, right? Because that, that connection that exists between the client and the server is unique to the client and the server. Um, with PNFS, it might be a little different. Um, so you could expect that there would be a delay while you know, the network realizes that network um, point is no longer there. And then the process or the, the service moves that IP around. So there could be, depending on how sensitive uh, your storage needs are, uh, you might have to tune your mount points um, to allow for a delay uh, if, if needed. Um, so there, there would be a, a little bit of a delay um, as, those, as those things move around. But that, I, I think, you know, I think that's, not necessarily unique to this solution as it is, it's just kind of the nature of, um, you know, TCP communications to a single endpoint. All right. Well, thank you for that question. Um, all right, well then I'm gonna move ahead and just show you real quick how to kind of wreck this. Um, and, uh, you know, it's our home lab. Sometimes we need to clean up. I know that, um, it does take up quite a bit of uh, capacity for me. So first thing I'm going to do is go to my file shares, and I'm going to I'm going to delete these. Now, actually, you know, before I do that, now nah, you know what? It's a lab. I'll clean that up manually later. Uh, I'll go ahead and just take these and delete. So hey, you want to delete all of these? Sure. You know, obviously you could do it one at a time if you needed to, or whatever else. But in this instance, I'm just going to go ahead and wreck it. All right. So you can see it's rolling through the different um, ESX hosts here. Probably doing one for, for each. So let's just let that finish. Um, now the next thing here, uh, hey, they're gone, cool. <clears throat> so the next thing is we're gonna go back into um, the you know, configure VCN services. And now we see file services is still showing as enabled. Uh, it's as simple as going disable. And it makes a note here. There's no file share, right? We're going to clear the config, but disabling file services does not remove the file shares. All the protocols, including access to the shares, are disrupted. So in theory, uh, if there's a reason to disable it, but you don't want to lose your data for, I don't know, whatever that use case would be, you could do that. For me, I want it all gone. So I'm going to go ahead and just hit disable. And now it's just going to kind of go in reverse um, and uh, undo what we did not too long ago. So we'll just let this finish. The, the one part that it doesn't touch, uh, actually there's two parts. It will keep this ESX agents um, a resource pool around. So that'll continue. That'll be a relic as will your, um, your port group. Since it didn't actually create it, it just leveraged it. Um, it'll leave that alone as well. So if you are truly trying to remove it from your environment, you'll still have to do a couple additional steps with the, the port group and that um, 
resource pool. So, you know, this is like watching paint dry as it's doing its things. So I'll go ahead and just suggest like, hey, any, any other questions, comments? Um, One uh, question here. Yeah. Um, okay, for example, you create a NFX share and yep. then the people, they transfer a file to the NFX share. So are we able to uh, look at this file transfer on the NFS, NFS share from the storage, I mean, the, the server, the template, the network, and the storage, that one. If you click the storage, are you able to find out those files we uploaded? That's a really good question. My understanding is no, that you can't no? because okay. um, it's similar to like, you know, um, there, could be, there could be reasons why, you know, uh, compliance, for example. Um, and so having that within there, you know, as long as you have access to that network and permissions to mount it, then you can go that way. Yeah, now I, I already see the answer because of I can see the NFS files notes one, two, three here. So that could be a, a kind of a VM. Yep. Uh, okay, C can you click inside of the uh, SSD or, or the DVS data, that one, to see is there any file inside it? Oh, sorry, uh, I apologize. Yeah, let me go back. Uh, um, yeah. so let's open, well, so we're, we're kind of at the point where I'm not sure what's gonna happen. But let's look here because it is in the process of deleting things. Okay, you got it. No, yeah, I got uh -huh. it. You reorganize the file. There you go. Is that what you're looking for? I mean, sad to say, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's gonna, it's All gonna right. disappear. And yeah, there's the deletes. Um, so that's the uh, stuff we'll probably leave. Hmm. Fantastic series. Okay, cool. Awesome. I know I have um, I have a customer who's interested in possibly using this for um, kind of a cluster quorum, if you will, uh, an SMB share um, for some cluster file services. And I thought, eh, okay, that's a really interesting use case for it um, because you know. Often with these cluster services, you just need a, a shared file system. And there's not a lot of IO that happens with those often if it's for quorum, it's really just kind of keeping track of what's going on. Um, so it's a very interesting use case for them. Um, you know, they were uh, looking at some other more expensive solutions. So, you know, crossing my fingers that they're testing for it will uh, we'll pay off. Anyway, well, with that, we can see it's disabled. Everything is back to how we were um, before. Just you know, a couple little things to clean up, but um, all in all, that's that's it. I you know, I was very impressed when I started down this path, trying to understand this the solution, how easy it was to set up, and you know, the mm -hmm. the prerequisites being a bunch of IP addresses, uh, you know, some capacity to run these FS VMs. Um, and you know a, a, a port group, right? From the from the vSphere side, it all seemed very very reasonable, and what you get out of the deal is pretty darn uh, pretty darn useful. So, anyway, I guess with that, uh, I'll go ahead and uh, end the recording. Uh, everybody, thank you so much for joining today, um, and you know keep on tamming, and then we'll see you at the next uh, the next Tam Lab.